everybody. Richard Dolan here for a courageous conversation. Well, I'm in today. You're right. There's no going back. How do you do? You feel the weight of that that desire? Yeah, I have been there for a while. The story's still being written, and you cut the story short. As they say, I'm playing with house money. They said, Ah, neo fascist. You can't imagine, Richard. I've heard everything now. But I'll tell you what, you ain't never buying your time back. Value your time. Nothing can humiliate me. I've already done that. He said, You taught me there was more to life than pain, and that kind of opened the door for thousands and thousands of kids. Like you just show up no matter what. This is a, an opportunity to, to kind of delve into yourself and actually pull out what you might have in there. It forced me to think about life after that, but. And it's funny because people need to laugh. You just pass it through, brother. Once you start a courageous conversation, there ain't ever going back to an ordinary one. We're joined by a lovely lady. I mean, I, there's so many ways I can introduce her, but the way in which you would want to know her as is as a professional athlete, an Olympian uh, by trade. I mean, this woman is what you'd consider somewhat of a gifted soul, uh, a dancer, a contortionist. I mean, a gymnast to some who under, doesn't understand what they're looking at. All I know is every time I watch Emily move her body in any way, shape or form, I feel like I need a good stretch. I, need a, I feel like I need a good stretch. But aside from that, she's a mother of two beautiful boys, so I'll leave her to announce who they are and who their names are, because I always think Mama Bear should be talking about the baby cubs. Uh, and then, of course, Mary, too, uh, an incredible uh, man of, of many great traits, but one of which is an actor. He's a musician, Jeff Goldblum. So let's just give her a real warm welcome, Emily Goldblum. Give her an applause, everybody. What's up, girl? <laughs> Thank you. So first and foremost, how have you been? How have you been keeping with, what would it be now in LA? Is this your fifth week, your sixth week of quarantine? How long has LA been locked down? I just calculated it the other day. and It was um, like 46 days. Um, so we've been, we've been doing good, you know, considering how long we've been doing this with for, mm -hmm. but um you know, it tests us, I think, just like everybody in these um, just strange and different times. You know, we're like, we were so used to our ebb and flow, and now we have to like recalibrate and refigure everything out. So um, I'm kind of proud of ourselves. And I think that's just part of who I am. Like, I take things in stride and I try to stay like calm and collected and take deep breaths and then, you know, deal with each situation at hand instead of getting ahead of myself. Cause that's natural. That's human. We, our minds like to race. Um, so I find that part of that training, mental training came from being an Olympic athlete, uh, even just like leading up to the Olympics, like that's the most challenging part. Like once you get to the Olympics, you can kind of, you know, it's nerve wracking. So it's a whole set of different mind games, but leading up to it, it's just like that insecurity of like, I'm working all like these four years and then I'd have to wait a whole other four years, three, you know, three and a half years to try and qualify even. So, you know, I feel like I have a good grasp and a good sense of, um, who I am and how to deal with uh, challenges or mental shifts that we have to jump into and in, in mm -hmm. everyday life, you know, not just in the COVID time. Yeah, that's what makes that's what makes you such a fascinating person. I mean, we're going to dive a little bit deeper into the fact that you know you're an Olympic athlete, uh, you know, award winning. Uh, you're you're a mother of two. And you're married to a Hollywood superstar. But then on top of that, you're a brand and you're a champion for a cause and you're a stand for some cool stuff. And we're going to cover all of that. But let's just go back to 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 where, where were you born? Where were you raised? And, and how did you end up in the in the Olympics? How did you end up pursuing that as the thing at Emily Gold, Goldblum? Well, Emily, back then, when you grew up, that's what you wanted to go and be. Yeah. Um, so I grew up, I was born in Etobicoke Hospital. And then we moved around a lot, but um, part of my childhood was in High Park. Then we moved to like Keswick, New York, Aurora. I mean, not New York, Newmarket, <laughs> Aurora. Um, and then finally kind of settled for a little while in North York. And that's where I went to high school. But I was always traveling um, in those, even in those times that we were moving and living in certain homes and stuff. 
Um, so I wasn't always in Toronto for very long, uh, starting from the age of 11. And that's when I started rhythmic gymnastics. But before then, I had already uh, found some beginning of my passion. Like I, I was two and a half years old when my sister was taking a ballet class and I couldn't help myself. Like I would just scurry away from my mom while she was getting my sister dressed for her ballet class. And I would like just jump into a class and the teacher's like, what's this, you know? And then my mom's like, where's, oh, there she is, you know? Um, So early on, I kind of had this idea that I wanted to perform and I didn't really know in what capacity. So I did dance for a long time with the combination of doing artistic gymnastics. So now the difference between rhythmic gymnastics and artistic, artistic is like Nadia Kamenichi, all the, the art, like the tumbling, the balance beam. And then rhythmic gymnastics is the one that's just not as popular or well-known in North America. Um, that's the one with the ribbon and the ball and the hoop and clubs. So we're always on the floor the whole time, but we have a different apparatus. And so, I think it, I can't remember which Olympics I was watching, but I didn't even tell anybody, but in my mind, I was like, I'm going to the Olympics. And I just, it's obviously as a young, I think I must've been nine, 10 that, you know, we're like confident you're invincible. You can do anything. You're like, I'm going to the Olympics. And so I had no idea what it was going to take, how I was going to get there. Um, But I think that's what makes part of my brand and who I am special because I don't, I don't tend to worry about the how I tend to worry more about the why, like I couldn't live without it. And that's why I, why I wanted to do it and why I I felt like it was like saving me. Mm -hmm. Um, And so, but, but just to interject for a moment and only because I know a little bit of your story and I don't want to, entrap you in, in any point of the conversation but right, right now we've got uh, michael jordan's incredible one last dance and it's covering across a number of shows of how it came to be that he became the champion he is today and one of the things that people get fascinated by is just the presence of his father and the turmoil that represent that may have catalyzed the competitor that he was mm-hmm. had it not been for that young brother that always seemed to have actually beat him if it wasn't for if it wasn't for if it wasn't for did you have one of those? Did you have the, if it wasn't for that, that turbulent relationship or that turbulent thing or that area of drama that, 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 that wasn't, if it wasn't for that, I wouldn't have become or done as I did. Yeah, I definitely did. Um, I had that with my father and I still will always, I love him dearly, but it definitely was, uh, you know, a difficult relationship. He was in and out of my life, in and out of, prison and so I think a part of me wanted to prove to him that like we are enough like me and our family and our sister my sister we are enough and I was like part like this this will show him that he doesn't need to do all that stuff that he can just be here with us and we are enough um so that's why I say it saved me because it gave me a channel to put that energy in. And instead of, yeah, like I, it's weird that at such a young age, I kind of, and I think that's like Michael Jordan, like we have this desire to survive and it's like, it maybe comes not always, but it maybe comes from a little bit of trauma at a young age. And I'm not saying that's across the board for everybody because there's a lot of successful athletes that have come from great homes, you know, but um, that's my, I think that's one of my dreams is like to mentor um, men and women and, and children who maybe come from backgrounds where it didn't start off so easy for them, you know, and I want everybody to have that chance. And I feel like sport and athleticism is such a powerful tool for young minds to channel that energy instead of being sucked into some other world that can be also, you know, very all encompassing, but in a dangerous way. Mm, listen, it is Friday afternoon. It is cocktail hour. And I, I don't want to get into any sucking of anything right now, but I got to tell you what, what's amazing is that as the athlete, as you are, I, I just so love who you've been. And there, there was a transition where, 
you married Jeff, you became a mom. And when I, when I observe you as a mom, there's such a discipline, like a disciplinary in you, but I mean, not the, not the whipping of a, a disciplinary. I mean, you are always teaching your children. I mean, I mean, Charlie, I mean, River, I mean, just always just teaching. Tell me, do you find that given the athlete that you are, that's given rise to the mother that you are today? Yes, definitely. And I think it's sort of so ingrained in me. It's hard to like take it out. And I am, I was, you know, thinking about this yesterday, last night, I was like, oh, I, I want to prepare because that's again, who I am as an athlete and as a human being now it's part of my fabric. And um, so of course I'm preparing and thinking about what, who am I? Like what makes me, me? And part of it is my free spiritedness. I feel like I'm a free spirit, but um, in a good way, I think for our relationship, because Jeff is such a free spirit, I have that, um, consistent sort of productive, I want to call it like sort of a productive structure for the kids. Um, and from every book that I've read from, you know, parenting and child rearing, I know, and teachers that I am in close contact with for both the uh, schools that the boys are with, that's always consistent across the board. What I hear is structure, structure, structure. And within that structure, in that like framework that they're so free able to choose and play and do whatever they want. Um, but there is, you know, okay, this transition is happening soon. So, so, you know, um, so we'll see. I mean, I'm no expert, but I, I do get a real kick out of the boys and we have a, an amazing time together. And of course we have tumultuous times, but I'm always able to like, get a grasp of and a hold of the situation. Mm. And I think that definitely comes from like the athlete in me. Like you just show up no matter what consistently. Mm. I love that. You, you just show up. And speaking of showing up for those who are just dialing in, you're, you're joining us live with Emily Goldblum all the way from her home in Beverly Hills, California, joining us to talk a bit about uh, what it means to be an Olympic athlete, what it means to become a mom, and what it means to be uh, a powerful wife and woman, leader and brand. Uh, so, so delighted to have you, Emily, from, from your home to mine. Uh, that being said, you know, when, when we look at these times right now, it sounds as though given the, the, the period of time that we're in, and we had a chat about this just the other day, where lots of new narratives are, are, are booming. I mean, you know, rights for this and, and acknowledgement for that and, and upholding diversity and whatnot. Um, but in all of that, how does a mom, a mom, a mom like you, especially given the responsibility you have to your brand and your, and your purpose and your passions, do you ever find it hard to balance the, the, the three being, being a wife, um, you know, and, and a lover and a partner being, being a mom and, but also wanting to be you, do you, do you find that's a tough thing right now, given the position and the place you're in? Yes. I would be lying if I said no. And how do you deal with it? How do you work with it? Well, I make sure that part of what I was talking about pre being prepared, I make sure for me being prepared is like getting a good rest, getting a good night's rest, you know? And so I'm very diligent about going to bed at approximately the same hour every night. And that gives me the freedom to wake up before everybody else <laughs> and get some of the things that I want to get accomplished done, or even if it's just like jotting down the things that I want to get done. So I don't forget when my mind is tired. Um, I'm at my best in the morning. I'm fresh. Um, I'm ready to go. So that's one of the, the tools that I, I do and I use for my, for my own sanity. And so that I can get, you know, some, some of the things that I want to get done without any distractions of anybody else. Cause yeah, there's a lot, you know, everybody wants something from me. Like, Oh, what's this? When's that? And I'm like, okay, hold on. I can only answer one question at a time. <laughs> Everyone calm down over here. <laughs> but, but so what time do you go to bed and how many hours of sleep do you get? Um, I mean, if I could, I'd probably get like nine, but I usually get about eight and a half, eight. Um, we'll go to bed depending, you know, eight thirty nine. Eight thirty is on like the good to early side, but cause we get to the, we get the boys usually in bed by seven thirty. but sometimes if we're like really on it, I can get the boys in bed by like seven ten, And so we get that extra 20 minutes. I'm like, okay, let's watch a little bit of our show right now. We're really into um, Babylon Berlin. 
Nice. I'm interested. <laughs> Well, that's good though. You know, so it just sounds like uh, structure is important. It sounds like following a schedule is important. It sounds like the discipline to stick to that plan, which is really hard to do right now, especially during this COVID-19. I mean, I'm, I'm looking at a lot of our friends uh, in LA who, who are working athletes, uh, working actors, uh, musicians, uh, people that we share a relationship with who haven't shaved since, you know, the beginning of March and, and they, and they hide behind this idea is like, well, it's, it's quarantine time, but I, there's no need to. Right. But it sounds like you just continue with some sense of normalcy. Do the kids know that there's anything wrong or amiss right now? Yes, they they don't see it. I, I mean, I get we're so. That's one of the things that I always wonder. Like we're pretty honest with the boys, um, so we've we've always start like if there's some sort of bad news we start with like a positive so we're like you're safe everything is going to be okay but right now you know because they were like why aren't we going to school why can't i see my friends they're asking us questions so i believe in in telling them sort of the truth in a, in a sweet and calm way so that they don't freak out because you know they're just little kids but um so we definitely you know, told them and they're, they're aware, like they, we, you know, if we go for a walk, they wear a mask, they disinfect their hands. So part of it inside, like as a mom, it breaks my heart a little bit. I'm like, oh my God, like, you know, he's like, oh, I touched that. I, I got to use my disinfectant, you know? And I'm like, oh, that sucks that he's already thinking about that and sort of taking on this extra responsibility at such a young age. But in a way, I'm... I prefer them to be aware and safe than just kind of fully in la la land. Um, so they, they definitely know that something's up and they know the name, they know coronavirus. Um, so they're excited when we can travel again. They're like, when can we go back to Toronto or Paris? You know, like hopefully sometime soon. Yeah, I, I want to know when I get to go back to Paris. <laughs> but, 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 but with all that being said, I mean, you know, having, having Jeff, Jeff Goldblum, your, your husband, I mean, the musician he is, and uh, I mean, I love what he did with Disney or rather on the Disney channel, the national geographic. I did, loved it. Loved it. Oh. He was so funny, but, but I mean, they must be just beside themselves having dad around for so much. Yeah. How, how's the whole family adjusting with a working actor and a power player the way he is? How are they adjusting to that new norm, including you? <laughs> um, it's interesting you ask that because just last week, Charlie was like, when is Dada going to get on a plane and travel again? Like, when's he going to work? And I was like, we'll see, you know. And then Jeff like kind of took offense to that. I was like, what, you don't want me around? And he's like, no, I do. I like you around. But um I think it was selfish reasons that he asked because he was like, well, this gifts and toys back. And so he, you know, kids are thinking of their themselves first. Um, and for me, how I've dealt with it is we've had like just last week, Jeff and I had kind of like a heated argument and it was just like, we're, 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 we're feeling a lot, you know, we're very, both of us, we know this about it, ourselves. We're very like emotional people. Um, but we're also leveled headed at the same time. So we just had to have like a discussion and make time for one another without the kids. Cause that's what the challenge is, is we're so, um, we're so pressed for our energy with the two of them all the time, all day long, except for when they nap and in the morning, um, so it was really nice. It was so nice that we were able to like sit down and talk and get out the source of like what was bothering us. And I think that's just our way where we're able to be honest with each other because I feel immensely respected by him. And I know he understands and knows that I love and respect him. So there's that mutual love and respect that, um, helps us get through these interesting, strange times. Is there something that you guys have discovered about each other that you never knew before, given the quarantine that you guys are living through? Mm, I, don't, I can't, I can't put my finger on that for, to, you know, name one thing because, you know, before we got married, we were, we were living together already. And we also we're, we're the type of people that like every step of the way we like to prepare for that. So before we got married, we kind of, we went and talked to our therapist and 
decided what that would look like. Um, but yeah, I, I feel like I've discovered more that like I am more of a sensitive person than I thought I am, thought I was because of just being trained in, in Russia. We're very like, you know, you're hurt, you're emotional, but you just brush it off. You, and it's also the athlete, like you just got to get through it. Um, but I don't have to do that in my relationship. So that's, that's been really, um, just a wonderful way to like, feel that you're safe, you know, that I can let down my guard and be vulnerable and, and upset and sad and angry with him. And he'll, he'll embrace it. You know, we can, there's a saying we are ripe we're a Rye family. For those of you who don't know what Rye is, it's um, it stands for Resources for Infant Educators. And there's this great saying that they always have and that they say to the children and, and that they want us to aspire to, us mean, being the parents, um, that we can tolerate all their emotions. We, and that just goes the same with us as adult relationships. We can tolerate all of our emotions, the good, the bad, the beautiful, but- um, And the broken phones, the broken phones. Yeah. <laughs> I turned my phone on airplane mode because I didn't want it to like keep dinging on the- no, I gotcha, I gotcha. I, but but knowing knowing um, knowing Jeff very little, I mean, he, he must be missing the opportunity of going out and shopping as as much as he as he would normally shop. Um, who's missing shopping more, you or him? <laughs> I think honestly, you guys get to see like the Jeff that goes out and then presents himself and is on. But this is strangely like in, he's enjoying it. He likes not always being always working and always being on and having to like rush from one airplane to the other. He loves his routine. Like, so for him, he, he likes this. He's like, this is great. You know, other than the actual situation at hand, but at home, um, you know, he has me and we're each other's best friends. We have the kids and we have everything we need. We're healthy. So we're, we're, he, he feels happy in that sense that he's getting this time to slow down. And I think he's, he's definitely been the type that to like embrace like that um, meditation, those values of like slowing down. So he's, you know, he's really taking the sign this, you know, from the world that like, it's time for us to slow down and enjoy this moment of being in together and discovering each other in a deeper, more profound way. You know, I love, I love that you said that because if there's one thing that, uh, if you're just joining us, by the way, we're, we're joined live here with Emily Goldblum straight in from her home in Beverly Hills, California, uh, the beautiful Olympic athlete, uh, mother of two river and Charlie mm -hmm. and, and, and a really incredible brand in the making who we're going to get to that point in a minute. But uh, you got to watch for what she's up to because, folks, she is really about empowering people to really live their most best, their most flexible life ever. More on that in a minute. But um, to, to all that, to all that point, I mean, given just where you guys are, uh, looking at you now wanting to build your brand, build a business, and, and knowing that this time has allowed you to get to better know you, and each and every one of you dialing in right now, you've got a chance to get to better know yourself. Uh, understand what's a priority, what you should be valuing, the things you don't need. Like, I, I mean, I, I don't even know when the last time I wore a watch, Emily. I, I mean, I'm more delightful to be with this drink than I am with a watch. And then now with a collection of watches, I don't even know if I need any of them at all. I, I mean, my phone just does just fine. It'll, it'll tell me what time it is. Um, but, but, but with all that being said, do you find that the family has shifted its values or its views anyway, given the, the, the amount of time that you've all spent together, um, what, whether it's the garden in the back that you guys love and appreciate more now than ever before or the walks together as a family as consistently as you are is there any one or two things that that pop up for you um i think it's what i was saying before is like being able to really enjoy each moment and stay present in that moment so now we have this new ritual where the boys come in the kitchen after breakfast, instead of us rushing to get their teeth brushed and get out the door to go to school, they come and they help me un, you know, take everything out of the dishwasher. I'll put, I run the dishwasher at night and then in the morning it's all ready to be put away. And I'm, I'm, you know, 
just shocked at, you know, Charlie's four, he'll be five in July and he's into it. He's like, okay, let's put the dishes away. He's like drying, putting, he knows, he likes to know that he knows where everything goes. They're taking this sense of like ownership in their home um, and not just in like their bedroom or their play area. Um, So yeah, there's like those new family rituals and Jeff even like, and I'm sort of like, he's helping with the dishes and washing pans and, and the, the pot for the, the oatmeal. So like, for me, that's like, what, that's a huge, a huge blessing. I'm like, wow, I never, ever thought that I would be in the next room with the boys and Jeff's like doing the dishes. So, so, so I've got to say, I got to do this because, you know, I've got such a massive love and uh, Emily's my dear friend. And uh, I've purposely left out a lot of just who, who Jeff is. So I'm getting a lot of private chats and people are saying, who's Jeff and who's Jeff. And so um, because Emily's a standalone brand, uh, she's a powerhouse. We're going to get to uh, what her purpose, what her business and, and the very thing she stands for in a moment. But just to correct this, uh, Emily just so happens to be married to Jeff Goldblum, uh, famously known for The Fly, uh, the Jurassic Park series. I mean, he's been a part of some of the highest grossing film uh, productions in the history of mankind and uh, an incredible musician and a delight to be around. I mean, he, he, he definitely is going to be one of the top 10 people I'll, I'll, I'll always want to invite to a dinner party should I ever have the opportunity to invite uh, only 10 people over, including, of course, Emily. Um, but that's who he is. So for all those who are just sitting into the private chat, just who's Jeff, who are you referring to, who's that star or celebrity, I've only done so by keeping him out of the conversation, the fact that this is about my dear friend, Emily, and not so much Jeff, but we can't help but understand who Jeff really is to really appreciate the beauty and who you are, uh, yeah. which is wonderful. Now, does he serenade you still? Does he serenade you still? Yes. Because the, the last time I saw him, he serenaded me. <laughs> I, and, and I, I mean, I, I broke a tear and he just, as we had a conversation, he sung a response and said, Jeff, how you been? Well, you know, I've been good. I've been great. I mean, he's, he serenaded me. I said, man, this is awesome. I yeah. mean, he's he so easily fall in lovable, uh, just as you are. But is he ser- still serenading you? Yes. I mean, he serenades me and the boys daily. He, that's why we're that's why we're okay in this because he has his piano. He, if he didn't have that, like if he couldn't play music every day, it would be a whole different situation. We would be, and if I couldn't like stretch and move and dance and do some of my aerial acrobatic conditioning, I, I would also be going crazy. You know, like we all have those things that hopefully, and that's part of my brand. I want people to know about themselves so well that, that they know what they can't live without. Um, and that they'll make sure that they value that in their life enough that they'll do it no matter what. And so, yeah, he's definitely, I mean, he's serenading us in the morning at night and every, you know, meal basically. Cause after, after we eat, he'll like slowly make his way to the piano. Um, mm. Do you guys decide on the goals that you have for River and Charlie? You know, a lot of people here, there, there's mothers and fathers here uh, who would love to know how, how you curate the direction for children. Do you have plans for them? Are, are there hopes and aspirations you want to instill in them or at least set them on a type of direction, whether it's academic or philanthropic or very values-based or, or socially responsible or just the the universe will figure it out for themselves. What direction are you guys aligned on as parents uh, for your two young boys? I mean, we want them to be of service and offer something to society, obviously. Like, that's our number one. And I think our number two is to, to have passion to have some sort something that they're passionate about Mm -hmm. because that was our case same you know for him his calling was acting and for me was training going to the olympics so that's all that i hope because i think and maybe i should you know self-analyze why like one of my biggest pet peeves is people like people who just don't care and just kind of like yeah like i for me i really want them to have something that they and and it's not just one particular thing it's just like passion of of life like to to live life we're so fortunate we have 
such a beautiful earth and we're given this amazing tool, our body, the human body and our mind. And if we can utilize it to serve us instead of letting our mind, you know, control and get us into these little negative spaces, I I think that they'll be just fine no matter what direction they take, whether it's like science or yeah, arts. Um, but right now, Charlie is very into like task oriented. Like he, man, I don't know if that's just like a masculine thing. Cause I find that they both, like, if you give them a task, they're like right on it. Um, but Charlie is on top of that. Like he wants to complete his workbook and then he feels like accomplished and proud and I see a lot of myself in them so that's why I don't want to say that it's exactly like masculine because I'm like well that's me to a T like I like accomplishing things give me a you know a deadline and I'm like thriving so um yeah I think that that's our those are our two things like we just want them to be like responsible adults that can contribute to society and not be a drain and then also um you know, just be so wildly passionate about life and living um, mm. in, their, in their time, you know, because who knows what it's going to be like. Well, you know, speaking of passionate and alive and living, I mean, let's talk a bit about your passion of being alive. And I mean, what's interesting is that if there's anyone that's in here that knows you, did you, did you notice that Catherine Samard or uh, Madame Samard is actually on huh? this call right now? She's listening in. Bonjour, You're Emily. <laughs> Bonjour, ça va? <laughs> <laughs> I used to meet her in Toronto. I follow her on Instagram, and then I thought that you were going to do a live, and I just had to show up and say oh, hi. Ça me fait plaisir de te voir. Tes enfants sont tellement mignons. Moi aussi, je suis toujours heureuse de t'entendre un petit peu de tes nouvelles sur Insta ou face Facebook. Oui, Instagram. Oui. Well, to, to, I, I got interrupt because for those who don't understand French, what what the the teacher just said, Madame Samard, because I have part time French. She says, "My God, for such a troublemaker, it's so good that you've made it. Well, you've done so good. So <laughs> lovely to see that you survived. Is that what oh. you is that not what you said, Madame Samard? Oh, for sure. No, she was a great kid. She was awesome. I haven't seen her in person since she was about fourteen years old. So, oh my God, but I can tell she is just the same, just awesome. <laughs> so Thank you. Wow. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for being here. It's so nice that every time I bump into people that know you, heard of you, have followed you from your uh, formal training in, in Russia, uh, through your whole journey through the Olympics and uh, during your courtship with, with Jeff Goldblum, um, where people are really excited about is just what you're doing now. I mean, when they follow you on Instagram, and if you've got a chance to follow Emily Goldblum, by all means, you should follow her under her name, Emily Goldblum, on Instagram. Uh, you'll be delighted to see that she's got daily posts, IG stories, and she's always doing one thing all the time. That's connecting with people to connect with themselves. And by way of body, I mean physically connecting, not that kind of connecting. It's still Friday, it's still cocktail hour, but not that kind of connecting. I mean, we're talking about developing you into a very understandable, full-flowing, moving machine. Understanding what strength and flexibility means, uh, complete recovery, uh, treatment of self. And in fact, just taking care of yourself. You know, Emily, tell me, wh why has it been important for you to be, to, to, to share that passion uh, with people on self-care, self-evolution, self-flex, self direction. I mean, just, just the idea of bettering oneself through uh, the physicality conversation around stretching, flexibility, uh, whether it's yoga or dance practice. Why don't you share a little bit of what you do and why it's important? Well, why I want to, you know, do this is because I like helping people and I find that I've had already, you know, good results already with just pe people on my Instagram whenever they touch base with me. They're like, oh, your exercises have helped so much. I feel like less pain here or there. Um, and then secondly, you know, by way of stretching and stretching your muscles to gain strength um, in a, you know, less low impact way, uh, it, it, it teaches us a lot about ourselves mentally. It, it, it prepares our mental game. And I found that that's kind of why that's one of my strengths. Like, I don't think I, I'm not so like 
just living in LA, like we would, when I was younger and people would be like, Oh, let's go to this place. So-and-so this person's going to be there. You could talk to them about that. Like, I'm not that type of person that like, I like, I don't really like to calculate why I do things. Like I do it because it brings joy and happiness and, and like that passion I was talking about. So it, it's like this real authentic, um, it's this real authentic like m movement that people, I want people to get in touch with how they move and what that makes, how that makes them feel and be able to use that and be able to bring that back when they need it. Like say they're going into a, you know, a meeting and they want to get a raise or they want to get the job. Like what kind of movement, what kind of stance, what kind of stretch can you do that will help you in your actual day-to-day -day life um, in accomplishing those goals that were going to help you thrive because I right. want people to not just live through life or go through the motions of life. Um, I want people to overcome their own challenges. And, and I think that starts by, by knowing yourself and I want to get to that by what I know best. And that's through stretching. And what does your, what's happening with your mind when you're go, going through a difficult part of your stretch journey? Um, and what, what does that tell you about yourself? You know, if every time you hit a bump or uh, an obstacle and you start to like manipulate the situation instead of just like breathing through it, you know, what's that tell you about in your day-to-day -day life, in your relationships, um, in your work life? I love it. I love it. I mean, I mean, you're talking about posture equals your power. And if you're writing down any notes, you got to write that down because Emily Goldblum is dropping some gold here, folks. Why don't we give her some love? Let's do a quick check in. Put in the chat room. Are we loving this, guys? Mm -hmm. Are we loving this? Are we, are, we, are we loving what Emily is sharing, letting us into her home, sharing with us just the love that she's got and the power for the direction in Charlie's life, River's life, Jeff's life. I mean, gosh, this is just fantastic, Emily. I mean, there is a true power in posture. And I mean, the, the state in which you get is based on the quality of the stance in which you take. And so, you know, when I first met you, Emily, I got, I mean, gosh, you're, you're, you're almost intimidating because of the fact that you just have this incredible presence about you. Um, you know, tell me what, what right now do you find is important for people listening to this conversation? What, sh where can they start? Where do they start? If they really, as they start to follow you and understand the importance of this movement you're, you're causing, which is uh, around human recovery, uh, human posture and bettering your relationship to and the consciousness with the way in which you stand, which equates to the way in which you breathe which will begin to give rise to a great, greater relationship to the things in your life, where can they start if they have no clue what that even means and, and how they can start fixing it small in small little increments leading to the bigger changes? Right. That's a great question. I would say, um, I would say, you know, to set yourself up for success, um, you want to start with micro goals, you know, so you want to figure out first, the first goal I would say would be find out your why, why are you doing this? Why do you want to start this business or why, you know, why do you do anything? Why do you get out of bed? You know, why do you make a meal? Why do you order a meal? Like, once you find out your why that's going to be tied in with like knowing yourself, then you, we sort of touched on this earlier, but you're going to show up and you're going to hold yourself accountable for the actions that you take in your life and, and the way you think, and you're going to, hopefully that's the, I feel like the last, it's really hard. You're going to start to see yourself in a more in a clearer way, um, instead of sugarcoating things or just sort of our brains can manipulate us into thinking like, Oh, well, I did my best. And I, you know, where I want us to like hold ourselves accountable and prioritize. I want people to like write down what it is their priority is. And what I mean about like setting yourself up for success and those micro goals, it's like, make that goal so, so, so easy that there is no way you will not do it. Because once you start creating that new neurological pathway, then you're, it's going to become a healthy habit. You're going to 
be proud. You're going to, you're going to do it for seven days, whether it was, I'm going to do five push ups before bed, or I'm going to do five push ups when I wake up from bed. You make it so easy that you're going to do it. You're going to feel good about yourself, one. And so you're going to want to repeat that. You're going to want to continue feeling good about yourself. Um, and then it's going to be a, a new habit and a new healthy habit. And that's, that's where I want people to, to go. I want them to set themselves up for success, you know, write down why they're doing that, why they want this, you know, are they doing it for their mom? Are they doing it for their loved one? Are they doing it for themselves and somebody for their children, for showing a good role model for your children? That's part of why I'm doing it. I would, I mean, I'm going to be honest. Like I want to be a good role model to my children. Um, and I know that sounds cheesy and nerdy and all of that, but that's who I am. And that's the only way I know um, I was affected by other people and their actions and their, you know, they were role models to me. So I think that's a very powerful um, tool. And I, I hope that people, I hope that, that that's where they start, you know, instead of like, oh, well, I want to do it because I want power or I want to be recognized. Like I did, the, I went to the Olympics because that's all that I could breathe, sleep, eat, think about, you know, like I, I miss so much of my childhood and it wasn't, it didn't feel like a sacrifice to me. I, I didn't have birthdays or I miss birthdays or I miss Christmases and New Year's, like being all the way training in Russia and of course with my crazy Bulgarian coach. But would I trade it for the world? Absolutely not. It worked for me. It doesn't work for everybody. And that's why I say, know yourself, know yourself better than anybody, better than any statistic quote, you know, like people, are saying like, if you read those Yuval Harari books that there's going to be like um, AIs that are going to know us better than ourselves. I say BS. Like I want us to know ourselves better than any AI just because of they're like analyzing where we look, you know, and that they're going to know us before we know ourselves. I, mm -hmm. I don't want that. <laughs> You know, you're such you're such a delight to speak to. You're so uh, sensitive and definitely tune in with just all the little sonic signatures of when the cues happen. You're just so amazing to be with. So thank you so much, Emily. Uh, you. Grateful for you. Grateful for your time. Grateful for your presence. I mean, everybody that's here are just, you know, everyday average folks who are just really trying to make things happen. And they're just really inspired by you. If you're noticing the chat room here, folks, you know, we're joined by Emily Goldblum live from her living room right in Beverly Hills, Los Angeles, from her home to yours. I mean, there's some people that want to ask some questions. And if you're okay with it, I'm screening some of the ones that want to come on in. Keith UT, for example, you're definitely one I'm going to be going to in a moment. Um, but we only have about 15 minutes left because people got to get to dinners and, and, and yeah. families and, and work and whatnot, uh, gardens and their kids. Uh, and I'm sure Jeff is holding down the fort as, as best as he can right now because he definitely probably needs you now more than ever before. Um, but you, you brought up something that I want to skip over. Um, when you talk about Boris and you talk about a coach and you talk about a mentor, tell me right now, Emily, given the woman you are, given the wife you are admired to be and the mother we admire you for, um, how important was having a mentor in your life, having a coach on your side? I mean, life changing, you know, I am a, I'm, I am who I am, who I was born to be. We all come out with a perspective, even as early as like four months old, I strongly believe that but we are able to change and we are able through our environment um through the natural environment that we live in and that we're exposed to we are able to um modify how we think and how we feel about certain things and so i grew up with a very demanding coach who never you know was um good enough wasn't good enough you know um and I had other role models, you know, in the world of gymnastics that were not as harsh, you know, like I had a, another Olympian, Camille Martins, who was Canadian, who went to the Olympics before me in 96. Um, and I looked up to, to her um, and she was very open to help and, and guide me in any way she could, you know, and I feel like once somebody believes in you, sometimes that's what it takes for you to believe in yourself. Um, and I, I don't know, I feel like oftentimes I, I, I am a little bit envious of certain people who have that ability naturally, but 
it's never, it's not here or there. Like if you have it naturally great, but if you don't, like I want people to reach out and, or just, you know, luckily have some sort of mentor that will believe in them and show them how unique and how special and what they have to offer, because that's what my coach did. She saw the, the drive that I had that no other girl had in Canada. And then she plucked me and took me to Russia um, because I, she knew I would be willing to, to go through that. And to, and, and that, that, that doesn't, that just doesn't happen enough. I find. And I think that that would be my advice is like for mentors is that they give the confidence and the power in the individual to believe in themselves and then prioritize themselves and take those necessary steps. You know, I'm just, I'm just blown away by what you just said, because aside from the fact that you already made a commitment to become one of the world's best, you already made the commitment that uh, you weren't going to be what you witnessed or saw, what you lived through and had to deal with. You just knew that there was a better version of you out there. And you trusted the people who said, you know what, I see something in you and I'm willing to take you to there, but are you going to be committed to those set of actions? Mm -hmm. So I just want to acknowledge you for just how courageous you, you had to have been to really, in fact, stick to that plan. So good for you, Emily. Okay. Um, I mean, you've got two beautiful boys as a result, and you've got an incredible life because of the women you were dedicated to being. Mm -hmm. um, and that just says a lot about you. So folks, uh, I mean, we've got 15 minutes left, uh, minus a couple of minutes. Uh, if you've got a question for Emily, with all due respect, I'd love for you to put it into the chat room so I can just take a look at it first, yeah. uh, as you can appreciate uh, who she is, what she represents, uh, it's important for us to understand what it is that uh, you love to ask her. But why don't we go straight to uh, Keith UT from Calgary, Alberta. Uh, he has a question for you. So, so Keith, why don't you just uh, unmute yourself and uh, ask Emily yourself uh, just what it is that you want to ask her today. Emily, thank you. First of all, thank you for taking your time from your family to be here with us. Uh, people that uh, just want to find out more about who you are. But uh, we, in what you said, I would love to know more about what your vision is and your why and how has it molded and changed from when you were an Olympic athlete to now being the professional and the mom driven person that you are in this world now. If you could help us understand that, that would be great. So the question is how how's my vision from did you say why or what? Yeah, what what is your vision and or your why, depending on how you define it is what is it now and how is how has it had fluidity from when you were the professional olympic athlete that you were to who you are now um i think that's thank you for asking that that's a wonderful question um for for me my my why it's it's it stemmed from from when i was a little girl and that is you know to to constantly be the best that I can be and, and set myself up for success so that I am feeling like I'm doing what I was put on earth to do. Um, and that, that is to be a role model, um, and to present, uh, just my daily actions to be present in the moment with my children and anything I do. Um, I'm, I certainly believe that like, I want to, if I'm not, if I can't be with my children a hundred percent of the time, if I can only be with them for 50% of the time, I want to give them a hundred percent of my undivided attention and focus. And I think that nowadays our focus is, uh, is challenged a little bit more because we have so many distractions and so easily, um, it, we're so easily able to just jump to something else. Um, but I think there's something that can be accomplished to a greater level if we do just focus our 100% attention on that one thing that we're doing at the time. And that's sort of my goal is like to mentor people and um, my children um, to, to expand themselves to their greatest, fullest potential so that they feel like they're thriving. And that's what I was doing as an Olympian. You know, I, I had purpose and I want people to feel that they have this immense purpose in life and not just, you know, I'm just a housewife, you know, because that's, that's so um, 
it's so in the past and we have so much to offer. Every individual has so much to offer. And I don't, I just feel like so many times, especially as young teenagers, we all want to be like this certain trend that's going on. Um, But then we just lose a little bit of our own unique self. And I, I don't want people to, if they've, you know, sort of lost that way, I want them to come back to it and find like, like I was saying, your why. Um, and for me, it's about that passion and that drive and being the best person that I can possibly be in my day to day life. Mm, you know, probably part of the challenge of hearing uh, Keith from, from Calgary is that he's actually not in Calgary, he's up in the, uh, well, the Northern Lights. So he, <laughs> signal must be hard. Signal must be hard. But I know we have one last question uh, that we might be able to squeeze in here from Ken. Uh, Ken comes all the way in from uh, Etobicoke. Uh, he's yeah. a dear friend of mine, but I know he has a question here. Ken, why don't you meet yourself and ask Emily yourself what, uh, what you had to ask? Hi, Emily from Etobicoke. How's it going? Hi, nice to see you. I'm you good. Too. You too. Excellent. So I want to know what was the transition like to leave your hometown and go after your dream? Like, how did you deal with family, friends and possibly losing those connections? Like, how did you how did you cope with it? What was it like? Uh, I know some people are struggling with those types of things, especially when they want to pursue what they want. Right. That's a great question. And I didn't elaborate on it. So this is a great opportunity for me to be able to do that. Um, when I started training in Russia, I was 11 years old. So I was very young. And um, I, I didn't have, I guess, I just felt like this is what I needed to do if I was serious about what I thought I wanted or I told myself I wanted. And I just, I don't know. I think that's just part of my DNA and how I'm made up that to my mom even brought it up to me when you know, she's like, I don't want, she didn't want me to go to Russia by myself with my coach. And she stayed in Canada. And like, bar- like back then we didn't have FaceTime iPhones. Like she could barely contact me. She was worried sick. I would be there for three, four months, you know, come back like 10 pounds lighter, like super, super skinny, but I was happy. And I just knew what made me happy. And I knew that I don't think I had the words for it at the time, but I felt like I would resent myself. And I think that's, you know, an adult speaking that I understand that now I wouldn't be able to cope with not trying. And I know other friends of mine who like were wonderful athletes or models, you know, and like you, you kind of gauge yourself and like if they didn't take that next step that would really require to be very serious or to the next level of professionalism, um, they're okay with that. They could live with themselves. Whereas I feel like my personality um, and what it meant to me at that time in my life. And like I say, it saved me. It was just kind of like, you know, the end all, like this is what I had to do. And I didn't see it as a sacrifice. So I think if you know what makes you happy and if you know what you can live and live without what compromises you're willing to, to, to live with, then everything else is just kind of, yeah, it's just kind of logistics, figuring it out and doing it. Wow. Talk talk about go to zero and get it done. Hey folks, my God, this has been Emily Goldblum folks. And uh, Hey, thanks so much for that, Ken. And uh, I know Kevin Honeycutt is on the line. I know that he actually already put into the chat room that uh, he says, quote, amazing. Emily is in the movie quote, La La Land 2016 is Emma Stone's stunt double. Yeah. Coincidentally, La La Land is actually being streamed live for free today at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on lionsgate.live yeah. forward slash. So how fun is that? Um, Emily, do you have time for one more question? Of course, I would love to. Oh, man, good, good. We got Ken, Ken Jocelyn from Alabama. Ken, are you there? Yes, sir, I am. Emily, thanks for being with us today. Man, just super appreciative of of you taking some time out of your family. Really, one of my questions I was going to ask, I think you hit at the end of Ken's question, and that was really talking about when you achieve at a high level, level the price that you have to pay to be able to do that. But I, literally, that's what I was going to ask. Mm-hmm. You, I think you explained that at the very end, that it wasn't a price for you because you, you felt like this is what I'm passionate, what I'm born to do. So mm-hmm. I'll just, I'll, I'll ask a, I'll ask a crazy question. Like, how did you meet your husband? Mm-hmm. And how, how, how did that process go from being an Olympic athlete to meeting a Hollywood person? And, and yeah. what, what did that process look like? Well, 
to start that off, like when I was already living in Hollywood for a while before I met Jeff, before I met my husband, um, and I was already, you know, successful. I was performing with Kanye and Justin Bieber and Christina Aguilera on stages all over for... Never heard of them. I have no idea what you're talking about. Um, yeah. So, you know, I was already holding my own and I had my own space in LA um, and I was managing dancers in a nightclub here. So, um, yeah, so I was very in a place of security already, which is an awesome place to be when you when you're potentially meeting the person, you know, that you're meant to be with. Um, I find that a lot of times some people dive into relationships a little bit too quick because maybe they're not in a place of security and they're not 100 percent OK with who they are. And, and they haven't dealt with all of that, those emotions that they're you know dealing with. Um, so I, I feel like that's so important, especially in a young woman's um, life. I, I, I Living on my own, not having roommates, having my own apartment was such a big deal for me. And I think, you know, we we can go through that another time. But there's so much that you can learn just by living by yourself. Um, um, and so we met at the gym of all places, um, which for us is kind of, you know, unique and, and, and perfect for who we are. We, we work out every morning together at like six in the morning. So we still have that connection. Um, and it's just it, it just speaks volumes of, of, of our connection and who we are as to people individually and as a pair. Um, we, we love to be healthy. Of course, we like to eat chocolate and we'll have a glass of wine. We'll share a glass of wine because he doesn't drink so much. Um, but yeah, it, it's just, it's nice when you meet in a place that you are already bettering yourself in, you know? Um, so we, we just, he came up to me. I didn't know who he was. Um, and he came and saw me perform that night. I was performing and a friend of mine, I was like, what, how did he get up on stage? Like that, this is the guy I met at the gym. And my girlfriend like peeked her out of head out of the change room where we had like our dressing room. And she's like, Oh my God, Em, you know who that is? And I was like, yeah, he told me his name's Jeff Goldblum. And she's like, yeah, Jeff Goldblum. And I was like, I know he told me that at the gym, <laughs> but I still just had no idea. And then she showed me and, you know, looked him up on IMDb and I was like, oh, his voice, his voice sounded familiar. Um, and then that kind of was just like, we were inseparable. I went and saw him perform. So that was on a Friday night. And then the next Wednesday, he had a jazz gig at this place called Cafe Was that no longer is anymore. And my two friends were in town from Berlin. They're circus artists as, as well as I was doing circus with them. And so we had a little too much to drink. And he was like, oh, Emily, every clap if Emily, this woman, he sang Emily, Emily, all the murmuring skies of May to me. And I was like, oh, I think he likes me to my There's friends. a serenading. See, he does it Come again. Yeah. The serenading. Yeah, yeah, he's got game. <laughs> oh my God, that's fantastic. Well, listen, it worked on me. I tell you, I, I, I mean, yeah. when we last met each other in the Prada store, I mean, gosh, I, I paid for his stuff. I'm like, what the hell's going on here? Yeah. He had to go hello. He just, he loves to connect with people. It's a very sweet um, personality trait of his. <laughs> Yeah. Hey, listen, Emily, so, so grateful for you. And uh, Ken, thanks for that question. I know that we couldn't get to everyone's questions. I know that everybody in here, I mean, uh, folks, can we give her some love? Can we give Emily some love? Because I mean, we, our time is now up and I want to make sure that she knows how much we are grateful for her in the chat room there, how much we are so uh, happy that she spent time away from her family uh, and her priorities and her passions uh, to give you an hour of her time. Uh, as we all as we're all just sharing the same exact experience, which is this quarantine self uh, relegation and such. Uh, Emily, any, any closing thoughts that you'd love to share with, with all these wonderful people who've uh, joined us live uh, with you in Beverly Hills, uh, any parting wisdom, any things you just wanted people to, to keep their spirits up and to uh, keep a positive outlook in the times that we've got right now? Yes, absolutely. I mean, I first of all want to say thank you to everyone and thank you to Rich for giving me this opportunity, you know, finding my voice. It's um it's really lovely to have this safe space and uh, the friend uh, and a mentor too. Like I look up to you and so um this this really means a lot to me. Um, because yeah, like I say, my thing is all movement, but I don't get to practice so much my voice and speaking to people and answering questions. So this is, um, just means a lot to me. Thank you so much. Oh, yeah. Um, but yeah, I was just looking up quotes from this. I read this book a long time ago. Um, it's by this like, uh, 
at this, he's a, neuro, he was a neurologist, he's deceased, but he was a, um, you know, a concentration camp survivor. And it was just made so much sense to like what we were going through a little bit now. And he says, when we are no longer able to change a situation, we are challenged to change ourselves. And I think that's, we touched a little bit on that today is um, our outlook and our ability to slow down and be with ourselves and then, you know, get to know ourselves and, and, and love that person, you know, love who we are in our own unique way. And then there was one other quote that he said that really resonated with me. And he was saying, everything can be taken from a man but one thing, the last of human freedoms to choose one's attitude in any given circumstance, um, to choose one's own way. And I think whether you're in business or an athlete or mother, um, that that's true for all of us human beings. We can choose our own way. We still have that. Um, and we can choose our attitude in our quarantine. Um, so I, I hope that we can all like, you know, get out of this stronger and positive and, you know, through love. Mm, so wonderfully said, you know, thank you so much. I mean, thank you from uh, everyone from coast to coast in Canada, mm -hmm. uh, across the United States, throughout Europe and, and around the world. Uh, Emily, we're grateful for you. We love you. Uh, we want you to know that we're so grateful for you. Send, send my love to the kids. Yeah. Uh, my love to Jeff on behalf of everybody here. Uh, stay safe, stay sane, but the easiest for you, stay sexy. Yeah. Uh, so, so, so thank you for very much. Mwah. You be yeah. well. Uh, you. Folks, this has been Emily Goldblum, everybody. Let's give her some love. And uh, until next time, uh, please check her out on Instagram. Uh, you'll love following her. You'll love her posts. You'll be inspired. Uh, and you'll need a stretch after stretching the way in which she does things. Um, more from her to come, because this is not the end of Emily Goldblum, but just the beginning. Emily, God bless you. Be well. Thank be you. safe. And to all of you, please be 10X, everybody. Yes. Bye, everybody.